It's the holiday season. You know what that means? Everyone gets fat. All right, we're going to talk about today's episode. <laughs> Inevitably. How you can actually lose weight this holiday season. Look, we've been training people for a long time, and there is a strategy that is specific to the holiday season that is quite effective. There's things you could do that not only prevent you from getting fat like everybody else, but you actually get leaner and enjoy the holidays. It's, it's called shaming your family members. That's right. That's wow. the one. Right. We, we do this big thing where we put a pool of money together and then we bet the over-under who's going to gain the most yeah, weight yeah. over the holidays. And then, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just, you just know. make them embarrassed. <laughs> no, you know, so the, the, I looked the this, this stats up. I, I remember us learning this, these, this data I've and heard, I actually looked it up to confirm it. Okay, so I can't wait to hear this because I, yeah. I've heard, this reminds me of the how many calories is muscle burn. Yeah. Like I've heard numbers. It's, just, it's repeated so many times. You think yes, it's, it's been yeah. repeated. And I've heard numbers from, I think as low as eight pounds to as high as like 20 something pounds. Yeah. So the average, per, the average American gains between one to eight pounds over the holiday season. Now, here's where they get that number. If you're uh, somewhat fit, then it's probably closer to one. If you're not that fit, if you're not working out, you already have some weight to lose, it's probably closer to eight or more. So yeah. in other words, the more un unfit you are, the more weight you're going to gain, the more fit you are, the less weight. You're I'm going to add one more factor to that. Like regionally where you're located in terms yeah. of like the, how cold it gets. That was a real thing when I was in Chicago. Yeah, it was like, yeah. you put on weight just to like survive. Yeah. And now here's, here's, this is another interesting statistic. This makes up for the weight that Americans gain during the holiday season makes up for roughly 50% of the total weight gain during the year. Now, that's wild. So if a person averages, you know, 10 pounds a year, uh, which is typically what you see, 5 to 10 pounds, sometimes more, a year, 50% of that's the holiday season. Then the rest is spread and out. And the holiday, holiday season is considered, I believe, Thanksgiving to New Year's. That's right. Yeah. That's right. They don't even count Halloween. Yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's like, Thanksgiving to New Year's uh, uh, where people- Which is really like, you're talking about a month and a half. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not a long time. <laughs> no. So it's a pretty short period of time where people gain um, uh, quite a bit of weight. And there's a few reasons for this. When you look at the data, and also just, again- uh, you know, we trained people for a long time. By the way, the, the holiday season is why January rush exists. This yeah. is why the fitness industry knows this very well. And it's not a secret anymore. It used to be. It used to be kind of it's this a like, big hustle. used to be this open secret in the gym industry that, um, you know, come January, this is when we're going to make uh, all of our sales, right? Um, and we would talk about it. And you didn't hear it uh, spoken about in the mainstream. Well, now it's, it's everybody knows this. Everybody knows January um, you know, New Year's resolution. This is when everybody starts a workout. This is when everybody starts a diet. But it has less to do with the fact that the year is just getting started and more to do with the fact that it follows this holiday season yeah. where people really go, yeah, they really go off. So they go off and New Year comes up and they're like, that's it. I'm going to try getting, um, you know, back into shape. By the way, uh, most people don't lose the weight that they gain over the holiday season. So if it's a few pounds, this keeps compounding. Yes. Um, and again, that, that, that that's where this stat I think is like, that's yeah. the skewed part is like you, you gain it and then you never lose it. And then the next year you gain it again. And so that's how it ends up being like <clears throat> way worse after just a few years of, of, of not dieting or, and the, and the heavier you are, the more gain, the more weight you gain. So it gets worse every year, theoretically based off of that. Right. Um, now there's a few different reasons why, this happens. One reason, and you kind of talked about this, Justin, is that people do move less because of the weather. Mm -hmm. Because the weather, even in in, in nice uh, places like California, like we have nice weather for the most part here, but it's still colder, it still rains a little more. Um, and of course, the context of living here is for you, it's bad weather. I know people in the Midwest are like, shut up, but I know. But you still see this here, even in California. People yeah, it's just, enough to people that normally go out for a walk outside. It's yeah. they're raining, so they don't. So. Yes. Well, yeah. and you know, human behavior. We're always looking for an excuse or a way out. That's of right. Like doing hard things. So you know, that's just a factor. It's like if it's cold, if it's darker than normal, it's like well, that's a deterrent. That's actually yeah. a good point too. It's also darker way earlier too. So I mean, that's I mean, I even noticed my own patterns yesterday. Right. So yesterday we had the we turned back the clocks. And, uh, you know, I, I didn't realize like how late I actually barbecue during the summer. I'll barbecue all the way till like 8 PM at night, like prepping for the yeah. week. 
on Sundays, and up and there's football going all day, so it's like a great day. I'm barbecuing, I'm watching football. It's like and I'm outside and cleaning mm-hmm. the yard, playing, and doing stuff. It was dark by five last night. I was yeah. like, oh shit! I was like, there up on there the flashlight, wrapping up my last bit of meat, and I'm like, oh, I'm not gonna stay out here and keep growing. So I'm then I'm now indoors at six o'clock, where normally I'd still be outside moving around. Yeah, and and there's probably an evolutionary um, explanation for this too. You know, we're not great uh, in the dark. Um, we're quite vulnerable to predators. So probably some evolutionary thing where it's dark. I mean, look, I don't know about you guys, but even I instinctually, when it's dark and cold, want to come inside and bundle up and want to watch a movie and want to sit around, you know, with my family. Even in the days of fireplaces, which you don't even see people using those anymore, it was still like, hey, let's start a fire and let's just sit around the fire and kind of relax. So people just generally uh, move less or just less active um, during the winter season, except for winter sports, but even that doesn't offset what we're talking about. Yeah. Um, you also have more food-based uh, celebrations. M- celebrations in general mm-hmm. are food-based, right? If you look at, and this is actually a good uh, conversation, people in the fitness industry oftentimes communicate food in such r- ridiculous ways that the average person can't connect with. Like they'll say things like, food is fuel, right? Yeah. No, it's not. It, it is, but it's also a lot more than just fuel. We connect over food and we celebrate over food. And there are, if I were to tell you. social. Yeah. And if I were to say, hey, give me top three foods that you eat at a birthday party or foods you eat at Thanksgiving or foods you eat for Christmas. Like there are foods that are distinctively. Foods at a baseball game. Yes. Yeah. Foods when you watch a movie. There's foods. We've connected a lot with experiences. And experiences. Mm -hmm. And a lot of our celebrations um, revolve around food and enjoyment uh, of food and connecting over food. So now you have these big celebrations um, and you're going to eat more food or be exposed to more of these different types of foods. And for many people, a lot of people don't talk about this. The holiday season is also a little bit stressful for a couple different reasons. One Mm -hmm. is uh, you got to buy gifts for Christmas. That stresses a lot of people out with financial issues. The other part a lot of people don't talk about is being around a lot of their family and so what they mm-hmm. do, how people tend to eat when they're stressed is they tend to eat more or they tend to to reach out for foods that are more comforting uh, which is you know aka um, more palatable right so if you're feeling a little stressed or anxious you're more likely to reach out for foods that are hedonistic uh, or flavorful so you have that in the mix as well mm-hmm. uh, and then finally alcohol um, if you look at the average person who doesn't drink they drink mm-hmm. on the holidays you know, this is another thing. Like, and alcohol is not a calorie-free food. No. Uh, alcohol has seven calories per gram, if I'm not mistaken. So it's pretty calorically dense. And alcohol also contributes to more calorie consumption because of its effects on the brain. So um, alcohol does affect the parts of the brain that, um, like the executive functioning part of the brain. So you're less in, you're less inhibited. This is why you tend to make stupid decisions when you drink, this this is also why, you know, when you tend to think to yourself like, ah, I probably shouldn't eat that. That'll hurt my stomach. Or I probably shouldn't eat that because it's not healthy. Yeah. Well, you get Override a few drinks. It. Yeah. A few drinks and you're like, let's go. This is why those those late night, you know, drive throughs uh, are get so popular. It's like people coming home from the club or whatever make those bad decisions. Honest question about uh, alcohol. Justin, this is proposed to you. Sure. Um and I say that just because I think that if you were to look at, I mean, uh, all of our like extra calories that are wasted that we each have, Sal's potato chips, I'm ice cream, you're probably a drink. Yep. Would, would you agree? Uh, yeah, that's okay. fair. Okay. So when it comes to the holiday season, do you do you personally see a tick up in the amount of alcohol you consume or is it consistent throughout the year, what you would say? Um, I would say there's it's intermittently ramped up. So, you know, you, you could literally point to like um, Christmas Eve, Christmas, and then like New Year's Eve. Yeah. And th- those are definitely ramped up. Like yeah. I'll, I will uh, admit, you know, I go a little heavy handed in those days. Uh, and it's really, it's it's a communal kind of like a social yeah. family event. Yeah. Uh, so instead of, but what I try to do with that is like, you know, lower the amount of treats and, and other things that kind of get in that, in that way but at the same time there's just so many factors to alcohol too it in- interrupts your sleep yeah like it, there's a lot of downstream effects that are negative to it that i do experience i was just curious because i 
I wouldn't consider myself like a really consistent drinker throughout the year. It's I'd say it's pretty sparse. But in the holiday season, you have a few. Yeah, I definitely kick it up. Yeah, same. I, I, so I was curious if someone who was more consistent throughout I the year. I almost never drink. I almost never. I drink. I drink no alcohol year round. I mean, you could probably. I can count on one hand the amount of times I'll drink alcohol throughout the year, and most of those are during the holiday season. Mm -hmm. um, that's when I'll tend to have yeah a drink or two. Yeah. So it, now the average person who does drink will have more. Mm -hmm. um, during, and, and it's again, it's it's just extra calories. And you brought, I mean, you said it very well. The downstream effects of alcohol consumption um, also contribute to weight gain because you're less inhibited. So you're more likely to eat the foods that you probably wouldn't. You're more likely to overeat. You're inflamed. Inflamed. Mm. It affects uh, hormones negatively. It affects your sleep negatively, which by the way, one of the fastest, easiest ways to ramp up cravings for hyper palatable food is to have a, a poor night of sleep. Yep. This is just uh, what ends up happening. There's also something to be said too, because what you brought up on the start this with is, you know, eight to 12 pounds uh, on the scale, right? But there's also another compounding effect that happens when you drink your calories is you also under consume your protein intake. Mm -hmm. You disrupt sleep, you consume extra calories, you don't hit protein intake many times. And so not only do you potentially put on some body fat, but many yeah. times you also lose muscle because that's also too. A lot of people during holiday season, you're probably less consistent with the gym than that's what right. you were in the peak of the summer. So your 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 volume of training is reduced, whether it's dramatically reduced or slightly well, reduced. People it's, oftentimes don't, don't work out or not at all, right? Yeah. So then you don't you don't exercise. You drink more calories than what you would normally normally drink because you're drinking those additional calories. They end up replacing <laughs> calories that would have probably been in protein, and so you not only put on pounds on the scale, which are probably body fat. You also potentially probably lost a little bit of lost muscle. a little bit of muscle. I, I was just thinking of like some of the actual because it's like cocktails, you know, like it, it changes like the way that I drink, and it's like if you've ever had like an eggnog cocktail, delicious. Yeah. Look at. The, the amount of calories you're oh, yeah. it's insane. Yeah. Oh, three and, of those is like a thousand calories. Yeah. Yeah. It's like and, and it's so easy to drink. And yeah. so to your point of like, you know, consuming through <laughs> drinking calories. At least it, there's egg in there. Oh my God. <laughs> no, and, and it that's, gets away from you really. The reason quick. why I brought that up, because again, I'm I'm in the stage again of tracking and it's already really hard for me to hit protein. If I were to drink a thousand calories and I love like eggnog, alcohol drinks and stuff like mm -hmm. that, especially around the holidays and that's the type of stuff. And if I were to drink at all during the year, it would be like a straight whiskey bourbon type of deal, right? It's not, yeah. I'm not making it like some, you know, thick yeah. eggnog or coffee or dessert drink like I would in the holidays. So I do think that there, there's actually, uh, there's even worse things going on here that w even what you're highlighting is that if you reduce volume of training in conjunction with poor sleep, in conjunction with, uh, you know, higher calorie and not hitting your protein tank, that's not only a recipe for putting body fat and weight on the scale, it's also a recipe for losing muscle. Hey, this episode is brought to you by Intera Skincare. They make peptide-based skincare products that are extremely effective Go check them out. Click on the link below to get a discount. All right, back to the show. Uh, so again, um, if if the average yep. person gains, let's say six pounds, let's just go in the middle here. Six pounds. They're not they're not counting the the one or two pounds of muscle loss. Right. So it's actually more now. And by the way, they do work out less. I mean, look, we all we worked in gyms for most of our careers. This is already a self selection bias of people that work out in gyms. Right. Let me ask you guys this: It's a ghost town. How much slower? Yeah, it's a ghost Is town. the gym? During the holiday season, yeah. it's uh, you're looking at fifty percent of the normal traffic yeah. that comes in. Not just new people wanting to sign up, but just people who have Period. memberships, workouts. Yes, workouts. In fact, for trainers, for trainers and fitness professionals, you had to figure out strategies to maintain yeah. your sessions because your clients would oh, cancel. November and December is yeah rough to to keep them coming in and keep that volume up. That's right. So the strategies that we all learned as trainers and coaches uh, over the years um, around this are ones that are tried and true because as trainers, we had to figure this out. We had to figure this out for our clients. So you know we trained people for a long time, and our passion, which still is this way, our, our passion still is helping people through our expertise, which is uh, health and fitness, nutrition, and exercise. And this was a problem to solve. This I, I dis, this was distinctly, I remember this distinctly being a problem to solve. There were a couple problems. One was, how do I get my clients to stay consistent? And how do I prevent the inevitable drop-off, weight gain, loss of, of, of fitness during the holiday season? 
and then help people so that when they come back in January, it doesn't become this kind of rebound thing, which then results in people quitting later as well. I mean, the majority of people that start back up in January quit a couple months later. And so the strategies we're going to discuss today are tried and true. These are the ones that we found to work very well. So we'll start with the first one, which is, and this I, took me a long time to figure out because remember when I train clients, I train clients in a gym or in my studio. It wasn't until I figured out how to get my clients to be consistent with their workouts at home that I really figured out getting them consistent overall. Because I was always trying to get them to come see me, see me in my studio, see me at the gym. And I realized as a trainer, if I could just get them to stay consistent, period, end of story with their workouts, everybody's going to win. And so I started to incorporate at home more convenient workouts. They were less likely to leave their home. They maybe traveled more. Maybe they had people visiting, so they didn't want to go to the gym because someone's visiting, but they had 30 minutes in the morning to work out or whatever. So I figured out workouts at home. And now all these workouts, all these workouts were geared towards building muscle. Why? Because I knew the additional muscle and strength would offset the additional calories that they were going to inevitably consume in the holiday season. So it was really effective strength training workouts that were convenient at home. That is the key here. I like this one because I was late to the party. Um, it wasn't until, and people that have been listening to the podcast and from the early days, I was the, the huge gym advocate and was like, oh yeah, I'm not big at working out at home. It wasn't until I think our partnership with PRX, did I ever invest? That was the first home gym that I ever invested in. Up until that point, I was always somebody who was training, uh, at the gym and I'll preach the same thing for the same reason you said, I want my clients to come in and see me. It was, it, it was good for my business to have them show up and, and train the hours. Um, later on, uh, was when I got a gym in my own home and realized like, Oh, you know what? Like the power of, and not only like training to build muscle, like you said, but even giving yourself the permission to just go out in the garage and do a set of squats. Totally. Like that totally. was a, that was a game changer for me was, you know what? Maybe my workout training isn't as intense and focused and consistent as it is in the summer uh, during this holiday season because I'm busy with family and doing other things and it's cold. But hey, you know what? Like because I've got this home gym, I can go in there and go do two sets of lunges. I can go do some pull ups throughout the day. Like, boy, that made a huge difference in mitigating the damage that normally I would put on in the this holidays. Is, this is when I got really good with teaching my clients how to utilize really convenient equipment like suspension trainers and bands. Mm -hmm. This is when I made suspension trainers and bands a part of my repertoire for my clients because now you have a garage gym, Adam. So do I, right? And I love them. I think that's the best thing. If you could, If you could do anything... Put a, 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 a rack in your garage, barbell, dumbbells, like adjustable bench, like you're set. You could do everything in that. However, most people don't have that. Most people don't care to do that. They don't have the space to do it, whatever. So get a suspension trainer, which you, you can hang it in any doorway. Yeah. And you can do, you know, one of the beauties of a suspension trainer are it's appropriate for beginners and it's also appropriate for super advanced. Just by the angles. Like I could change the angle and the tension uh, positioning of a suspension trainer to where I could challenge the strongest person that I know, but I could also adjust the angles and and have you know my 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 grandmother's sister do a couple exercises and get uh, you know and get an appropriate workout. So it's super adjustable, super convenient. And then bands, bands are also convenient. I can utilize different angles. I could train, and with those two things, I was able to put together frequent short workouts for my clients yeah. that they, and it, it kept them so consistent. I actually kept them consistent seeing me too. Cause you guys know this, yeah. if they're consistent, they're consistent across the board. And so the at home, and, and it was always strength training. It was not, now we did incorporate, we'll talk about this later, calorie burning workouts, which we'll talk about ones where we're trying to burn more calories, but the main workouts were strength training because I knew if they had muscle, then if they had the occasional big meal, they could burn it through their faster. Yeah, it's, it's game changer having that accessibility at your house. And really it's like a, relieving yourself of the idea that just doing one exercise is not as valuable as like yeah. a full workout. What it does is it just keeps that stimulus alive. It keeps your momentum somewhat sparked. That spark is still there for you then to build off that. Even the next day you'll get this energy and you're like, wow, I can do more. 
Um, and it, it's sort of like it, just knowing that I can do that one thing, uh, my body is a lot more likely to want to keep moving and keep lifting things going forward versus me just like uh, dismissing it. I'll get to it tomorrow. You know, it starts getting colder and colder mm -hmm. in terms of the amount of spark I have left. I, I want to go a little bit deeper on the point that you were making, Sal, because I was just communicating this to my family and it was like this aha moment for them that I guess I was like, well, maybe I can be better about how I communicate that or maybe I don't say that enough because it was such a surprise to them to, to grasp how this works. Because their their idea or their attitude was like, oh, well, we're effing it up drinking and eating all these all this extra calories anyways. Like, why waste my time working out? And I explained to them, like, there's there's the, let's, let's take two scenarios um, and you eat exactly and drink exactly the same, right? So you, let's just say you will overeat by 500 calories, okay? Whether that's through alcohol, same, right? The exact same thing. But in one scenario, the day before, you got this great workout in, and in another scenario, you didn't do any workout whatsoever. Those additional 500 calories, some of those calories are going to get partitioned over to building muscle that's right. that are going to go to a positive thing for your right. body, which then is only going to build more muscle, speed up your metabolism, that's and right. then your body can have even more calories in the future versus the other version of you that didn't work out, those 500 calories all get body stored fat. as body fat. Mm -hmm. And they were all like blown away by that that understanding. And then like, the additional muscle speeds up your metabolism, which then makes it e e so that you can eat even more next time yeah. and not gain the body yeah. fat. It's just a, it's, a, it's a winning strategy. But the key with this, the key with this, were at-home workouts because uh, getting them to come to the gym is so much more challenging during the holiday season for a million different reasons. Sure. Do, and doing it at home, you could do it very effectively, uh, like I said. Now, next is to walk after your meals, especially after big meals. Now, this is not because you're burning a lot of calories. I want to be very clear. It's not because a 10-minute walk after your meals is going to substantially burn yeah, a significant- It's going to offset it or something. Yeah, like, oh, yeah. I, you know, I just ate 1,200 calories. Yeah. I'm going to go walk for 10 minutes. Cool, you burn 50 calories. That's not why you do the walk post post it's post prandial. It's called post prandial. Walking after you after you eat, or or flexing and relaxing your muscles after you eat, to put it more more specifically, reduces the blood sugar effect. It actually makes the hormonal effect or the potential hormonal damage from eating far less. In fact, I'll give you two scenarios. If somebody did a one hour walk every single day versus somebody who just walked for 10 minutes after breakfast, lunch, and dinner. In other words, they walked half as much, but the difference was they did it post Timely. breakfast, lunch, and dinner. The blood sugar effects from the second scenario, the 10-minute post-prandial walk, are significantly better. Now, why is that? Well, when you eat food, you you you, you get this, this sugar in your blood, and it has to go somewhere. Well, when you're flexing and relaxing your muscle, think of it this way. This is the analogy I like to use. Imagine a sponge getting squeezed and opened. It's sucking up all that sugar as glycogen. And it's literally getting shuttled into your muscle. It's making your body more insulin sensitive. In fact, when you talk to uh, longevity experts, they say, aside from strength training, this is one of the best things you could possibly do for your insulin sensitivity is to simply move. In fact, there was a study recently, relatively recently, like over the last few years, where they had people postprandial, so after they ate, they didn't even get up and walk. You know what they did? They did heel calf raises, raises while yeah. seated. They didn't even yeah. they weren't even doing standing calf. They just did this, yeah. where they just lift their heels. And I think they did it. For, I don't remember how many reps they did. It wasn't that much. And you saw a significant difference in blood sugar. Now, why is that important? Well, if you stay insulin sensitive, you're less likely to store body fat. You're more likely to build muscle, and you're healthier. You are generally healthier. This is called. This is what will promote metabolic health. Or on the opposite side, if you don't do this, this is where metabolic dysfunction starts to occur. Hey, sorry to interrupt. Look, I have a free guide that teaches you how to lose fat in three steps, just three steps that will burn the most amount of body fat and help keep it off. This guide is totally free. We're giving it to everybody right now. If you want it, click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, back to the show. This also, by the way, blood sugar spikes and drops also affect your behaviors. So when you get these ups and downs in blood sugar, you're more likely to have cravings. You're more likely to have energy crashes. You're more likely to have anxiety. You're more likely to have sleep disturbances that come from the food that you eat. Mm -hmm. This is especially important for big meals. You have that big Christmas dinner, go for a 10 minute walk. Now here's the, the, the additional plus side of this. I love this part right here I'm about to say, I love, because I'm a big family person. I have a big family. 
I love family. I think there's so much value to the holidays for connecting with people. I invite people with me on a walk after meals and everybody likes to join for some reason. And it's not like a, let's go run. It's like, Hey, everybody want to go on a walk? And I have like 40 people will join me and we go on this nice, and it's a 10 minute walk after eating and everybody's getting this healthy effect. But I also get the simultaneous benefit of connecting with my family. So this was actually something that I had for our notes in our, our qua and I didn't bring it up, but it, it's, uh, relates to this, this point. And I'm, I'm kind of excited to go through this holiday season while in the middle of this tracking everything I'm doing. One of the things I'm tracking now is I'm tracking my steps. And I just recently moved to giving myself some sort of goal. And it's nothing crazy. I was averaging 8,000 or so steps a day. So I'm the target is to hit 10,000 now, right? Just a slightly up ticket. And one of the things that I was just making notes uh, as I'm going through this whole process of like, Man, it's really wild uh, when I when I have a simple goal like that. It's not crazy. Uh, I'm just being aware of it. For it makes me get up and do things that I probably wouldn't do had, had I not had that goal. Mm. And so I love to give a client who's heading into the holidays. We would figure out before they go in there about where they average in steps, right? And then I go, you know what? We're just going to try and do nothing crazy. You know, you average six thousand. We're going to go for eight thousand. We're going to increase the steps just a tiny bit. And you find throughout the day places to insert those steps, whether it be right after the meals, because that's an ideal place to get it, or first thing in the morning, or right before you go to bed, or these little. Th or what I found myself doing is I make excuses to go clean the house or help my wife, and and it's like. It's stuff that's supporting us and supporting the family and also keeping our house clean. And it's something like, for example, I did the car the other day. I would normally pay someone to do the car. Instead, now I wash the car because I needed more steps. So why not go do something that I don't mind doing anyways? And so, you know, I'm noting this down. I'm going like, man, it's I'm such a better husband. I'm a better partner. I'm a lot better. of downstream effects. Yes, right? a lot of downstream effects aside from that I'm trying to be healthier yeah. and fit. And so I love adding that to this idea of walking after meals is, hey, why not even head into the holidays, figuring out kind of what your average steps are, and then just set a goal to, hey, I'm going to just uptick it a tiny bit, you know? Yep. But again, I'm going to hammer this home. If you do this after meals versus at other times, even if the other times is more walking, you're going to get more health benefits from the post meal walk. And it doesn't, again, it doesn't have to be much. It's literally like mm -hmm. an eight to 10 minute walk. This is a wonderful holiday hack, especially because you could bring along family members with you. All right, next up, this is my favorite. What I'm about to say is my absolute favorite holiday diet hack, hands down. When you walk into the holiday celebration and you're looking at the food, there are going to be meals that are high protein and there are going to be other meals. Here's what you do. Go for the high protein meals and eat those first. That's it. Eat those first, eat them until you're satisfied, and you will generally eat less calories overall because you simply did that. And you'll also simultaneously hit your protein targets, which contribute to muscle and contribute to fat loss. So you, you hit like three birds with one stone. I know PETA doesn't like that, but, <laughs> but you, you- You feed three bo uh, birds with, with a scone. one scone, that's yeah, right. Yeah. So it, literally, you walk in the room, this is what I do. I look at the meals and I go, okay, we got this dish, that dish, that. here's the protein meal. I'm going to go get my plate and fill it up with that and maybe some vegetables first. I'm going to eat all that first. Once I feel kind of like satisfied, then if I have room, I'll enjoy some of the other stuff. And again, the, the, when they do studies on this and you track people, and I used to have clients track this. I'd have them do this and track it. But like you ate 300 less calories. You ate 400 less calories and you had higher protein all, simply because you changed the order of your meal. Yeah. You didn't even say to yourself you're going to eat less. You just changed the order. That's all you did. You know, my, my family gets mad at me for this one because I eat all the turkey. <laughs> and I eat it first. But it's like it is. It's always been that sort of uh, hack for me because load up, you know, get to the point where you're satisfied. And then, you know, I'll get the cruciferous vegetables next. And then I'll go for, you know, the jello that somebody made or the mm. Danish or whatever the, you know. But you're just at that point, you're just satisfied. And I know that at least I have like the, the building blocks, the materials for me, uh, in terms of like, you know, the, the actual nutrients, get the nutrients first, and then we can kind of play around. It actually just naturally reduces the amount of stuff you're interested in. That's right. This is the most powerful tip by far. And one that if you've never done, not only do I urge you to, uh, practice this right now or implement this into the holiday season, but try and keep this practice throughout the year. 
Th- I mean, to this me, is always good. I, I think that if I had to put a number to how impactful this has been for myself personally, this probably keeps me a solid 4%, maybe 5% leaner year round by just just practicing this rule. I would, I would no, agree. No other rules, just simply. Yeah, if you flip this and ate the protein last, for sure, 5% gain. It, 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 it is, a, it is a, a game changer on keeping you healthy and fit. And there's something to be said, too, about the psychological effect that Justin was kind of alluding to is that I'm not going to tell myself I can't have the Danish, I can't have the Jello, I can't have the sweet potato yam. I can't, I can, I'm going to say I can have it or the apple pie. I'm going to enjoy that. But all I'm going to do is say, I'm going to go eat what I need protein wise first. Mm-hmm. And then however I feel will dictate how much of that. I, and what ends up happening is nine times out of 10, I get so full from that. I either Dude. don't even want the dessert or I can have Let's a take bites. Yeah. I have a bite or a small portion of it. And I feel plenty plenty satisfied and then this also mitigates what i said earlier about the the compounding effect of drinking too much alcohol for your calories is you also are going to at least hopefully sustain the muscle so even if you didn't work out that day and at least you hit your protein intake and you don't completely atrophy and go backwards and so hitting your protein intake keeping you satisfied the psychological this is by far the most powerful tip of all the tips. Totally. All right, next up, I'm going to say this one cautiously because you can go too far with this, but it is a viable strategy, and that's to undulate your calories. All right, what do I mean by that? Well, you got a holiday party coming up. You can eat lower calories for two days leading up to it to offset the higher calories you're going to have uh, on the holiday. Now, I say it cautiously because you don't want to make this a restrict binge scenario where I'm starving myself only so I can go binge. Do this uh, with kind of a judicious approach, a little bit of a planned approach. What I tend to do when I do this, if I do this, which I really do, but if I do, what I tend to do is I don't eat carbohydrates leading up to uh, a holiday party. And I do that only because carbohydrates are not essential, uh, whereas fats and proteins are. So I'm not lacking any essential nutrients. And then I move into the holiday party, eat the protein first and eat the rest. But this is what I would tell my clients to do as well is it's, Hey, you know, leading up to your, your, your Thanksgiving, let's, let's write, let's, let's come up with some ideas for some lower calorie days. We'll keep them high protein. And, and then when you average it out and it's funny, I've had a couple clients, like clients who were willing to do this. I, I didn't push this on people, but I had clients that tracked and we would look at their averages. And when they do this, their averages for the calories were the same mm-hmm. because they, they came in lower, ate a high, they did have a high calorie day on the holiday, but when we average it out, which is how the body works, it averages things out. It actually came out to the same as the week before. So it is a viable strategy for sure. I I actually do what you do where I cut the carbs now before the main event, right? Because I used to fast before I would go into the main event, but then I found I was still having a hard time getting my protein intake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I have so many grams of protein that I need to eat for like my daily, my, my daily I'm like, okay, if I wait all the way till Thanksgiving dinner and I don't have anything, and then I try and consume, I mean, it's the-, That's the 200 grams. You'd have yeah, to, you know. 200 grams of, of turkey even is a lot of <laughs> so turkey to sit down and it's eat that in one sitting. And so what I found is, okay, if I allow myself to just have like fats and protein leading up to that, and so maybe I go in with say 60 to 80 grams of protein, and then I load up on the protein, yep. and then I can eat whatever I want after that. That's been a really good strategy for for keeping the calories down, still hitting the protein intake, and then also not telling myself I can't have. Yes. Now, you've probably heard us say on the podcast before that just trying to burn a lot of calories with exercise is a losing strategy, and it is in the long term. But in the short term, before your body adapts, uh, it has, actually is a decent strategy. What I mean by short term is like over a few-week period. So this is a good time to utilize high-intensity interval training for short periods to offset the calories. Now, high intensity interval training burns a lot of calories in a short period of time. Like a 20 minute hit workout will burn as many calories as an hour, hour and 20 minute other kind of or traditional workout. Now the best time to do these workouts is the morning of the holiday meal. Uh, when they when you look at the, the research or the data on continual glucose monitors, when people do a hit workout that morning and then that later that, that afternoon or evening, they have their meal. The blood sugar effects are largely blunted. So this is a great time. Plus, HIIT workouts are short. So if you're like, you got people visiting and you know you you, you got limited time or whatever, like a, a 15 to 20 minute HIIT workout, a real effective calorie burning way. Hey, sorry to interrupt. Look, for the holiday season, here's what we did. We put together an at-home workout program bundle. Maps Anywhere, Maps Suspension, Maps Hit, all three of them together, together, for $99.99, click on the link below to get started. 
All right, back to the show. Now, the challenge with this, I got to say this, is that most HIIT workouts are terribly, terribly programmed. Yes. There's some of the worst, what I mean by program, for people who don't know, is the organization organization of the exercises and how people do them. It just because, like, they're so poorly programmed that you can just pick any five exercises, do them as fast as you can, and you've done an equivalent workout. Really well programmed HIIT workouts are in a completely different universe. So if you do a HIIT workout, make sure it's it's well programmed. But nonetheless, short Hard workout, burns a lot of calories, morning of the meal makes a big difference. Now, yeah. the science to support that is, is that because you expend so much yep. and you're, you basically dump the glycogen out of your muscles. And so now you have all these stores for glycogen mm -hmm. that are waiting to get taken. They're prime. Yeah. They're they prime to take on. To, yes. So then when you go, Oh, you go eat 1500 calories in one yeah, sitting, a good of majority of that goes back to just filling your gas tanks back That's up right. before you overspill. Okay. And That's then you, right. then you add the compounding effect of that of you've also sent a signal to build muscle so that any additional calories that say That's overspill right. or go beyond the total you need hopefully get partitioned over into building That's right. muscle this too. was my this was literally my my blueprint for clients during the holiday season they came out oftentimes better than they did going in mm -hmm. got some questions here the first one is what are the best holiday foods and what are the worst the best holiday foods protein uh, all the meats yeah. Yeah, all yeah, the meats, all the meats like almost the every every holiday like everyone either does hams turkey right like yeah. those are all the big you know, popular dishes around the holidays. I would say right? the meats and the vegetables right. are the best. The worst are got to be the sweets. You know, mm. uh, all the pastries and pies and desserts um, are, have got to be the, the the worst ones that I can think of. I would say stuffing too, right? Stuffing is is not great. I mean, a lot of the carb carb meals are bad because a lot of them are just like even like uh, you, I mean, you guys had your family do the sweet potato yams that are like covered in maple syrup and and marshmallow and stuff like that. And there's like a lot of the carb dishes are just sugar and a uh, lot of extra. Yeah. We have sugar this, on everything. Like yeah. stick to the protein. Like yeah. literally yeah. eat. Eat an abundance of and the gravies. Meat. The gravies are off, off. Although delicious, often just add a bunch of like, uh, you know, not useful calories to whatever you're dumping them all over. Yeah. Um, I have an aunt that makes, she makes the best stuffing. It's so good, but it's literally just it's all bread and and starches <laughs> and just you know you pour gravy all over and it's just this really crazy calorie bomb with zero protein there's in it. so many jellos I, I don't know why <laughs> you guys yeah, have a big jello family yeah we're just jello and marshmallow people yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, i wish we weren't i mean well, katrina's family does the all like you know ruins all the vegetables by putting bacon grease in all of it you know what i'm saying <laughs> yeah. they cook all of it so there's you know like bacon in all of them you know what else you know what else is really damaging i don't know if you guys a lot of families do this mine does you have your big meal and then there's like a dessert table that stays out for the rest of the night. Yeah. yeah. And it's like cookies yeah. and candies and pastries fudge. and pies and fudge. See, and here's the thing, though. And this, this is to the point of if you just know, and this is where there's value to kind of tracking, get any idea of like, what is what do I need for optimal protein? So let's, using me, it's 200 grams, let's say. Going in and saying, hey, I'm going to let myself go have some of those pies tonight. So long as I go get those 200 yeah. grams of protein first. If I do that, I don't even have that much of a desire to. Now, if I under eat on protein then I, and that appetite kicks up and yep. that's my choice out there, I could easily crush two, 3,000 calories totally. of pie and dessert. So that's the that's the part you got to watch out for. Yeah. My weakness, pecan pie. Oh, mm. man. If that's I a good one. Ice cream on top of it. Oh. Vanilla ice cream yeah. on top. Ooh. Done deal. Next question is, which alcohol does the least damage? Straight. Straight. Straight, straight alcohol. It's vodka's vodka. the lowest. Vodka's okay. the lowest, right? Yeah. Vodka's the lowest. Yeah. Whiskey's not too far behind, it's though. not bad. You them, know, yeah. here's the, there's two strategies with alcohol, uh, in my opinion. Take One, it rectally. What? No. Oh, that's not what you're going to say. No, I'm not, I'm not that it, Some people do that. Isn't it twice as strong that way? Isn't it twice as strong? I don't even recommend that. People die from that. Yeah. No, I. Um, the two strategies are I either drink to get the effects or I drink to enjoy the drink. Yeah. I think if you drink to get the effects of the alcohol, which is me, because I don't drink the, the taste. Do it fasted. Then it's no, it's literally <laughs> your advice right now is just absolutely true. Yeah. It's literally vodka yeah. and, and 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 soda water uh -huh. or seltzer yeah. with a little lime. There's, there's so low calorie. I drink one or two of those. I have a buzz. 
Um, so that's that's the strategy for me. So if you if you want it just for the buzz or just for social I mean, anxiety, periods, the best is just straight liquor. If you're looking for the health healthy wise, right? It's the what kills people calories is the calories in the mixed drinks. It's yeah. the eggnog that Justin brought Everything up. Everything else is going to be riddled with sugar. Yeah, and margaritas, coca, the cocoa, yes. margarita, peppermint, snop stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you just you got all kinds of calories. Yeah, just ice, you know, yeah. to to cut down a little bit of the harshness. And you're good. Yeah. I get stressed for holiday parties and fear of fat gain. Should I skip them? No. So what I don't want to communicate with this is that uh, the value of the connecting with your family and of celebrating these these, these holidays isn't worth uh, the potential quote unquote damage. Look, if you are healthy for most of the year, you exercise relatively consistently. You have a decent relationship with food. You go into the holiday, like you're okay. And even if you're not okay, even if you overindulge or whatever, like it's one or two days, like I don't want to, because there are fitness fanatics like this where they go into the holidays and they don't even enjoy the holiday because all they're tr doing is tracking their calories. Yeah. When am I going to get my workout? And that's they miss just out. As, that's on just as unhealthy, just for yes. a different reason. Yeah. Yes. It, here, here's the thing too. If you actually, if you actually follow this advice, um, and let's just say on top of that, you really overeat. You're not going to do you're, as okay. much, you're not going to do nearly as much damage as you think you're going to do. You're not putting five pounds of fat on in no. from two days. Yeah, from two yeah. days of of eating pumpkin this pie and two stuff. Two days, like, especially relax. if you got the workouts in there. Especially if you hit your protein intake in there. Especially if you make those walks afterwards. If you hit the tips that we're saying. I would, I would, I and I, I, I hate to do this, but I would if you were my client. I'd say, I'm. Don't worry. Go enjoy yourself yeah. and be have, with your family. Have your, have your pie. Have yeah. your stuff like that. But go hit your protein intake. Take the walks like I told you. Yes. Get your little workout in with your bands like I told you to do. And then enjoy the shit out of your food. And have again, a good time. Have a good drink. This is why we stress building the body and building the metabolism so you have flexibility. You yeah. know, if you don't have that flexibility and you're paranoid about that, that's a problem in itself. Totally. Now here's what we did. Right, we have workout programs that are perfect for what we talked about. We have a program called Maps Anywhere. That is a at home or anywhere based workout. We have a suspension trainer based program, which also just uses a suspension trainer. And then we have a high intensity interval training workout program. So all three of those individually over a hundred dollars each. Okay. So here's what we did for this episode only for the holiday season only just this episode, all three of them, you get all three of them together combined for $99 and 99 cents or so for 99 99. You get Maps Anywhere, Maps Suspension, and Maps Hit. All of those for this episode only. All you got to do is go to mapsnovember.com. All right, I know you liked that episode. If you did, check this one out. 30% body fat. For men, this is way too high. This is actually a bit high for women as well. So in today's episode, we're talking about how you can go from 30 to 10. What is 10% body fat? This is when you have a visible six-pack. Can you go from 30 to 10%? Yes, it's possible but not if you guess along the way. So we're gonna talk about how you can do that in today's episode. Now there's a huge range, right, of like body types. Yes. Some people can run uh, a little bit heavier uh, and, or a little bit higher.